So our topic today for this morning is moral sanction. Now this is, this is an important issue in objectivism. It's certainly central to Atlas Shrugged, to the story of Atlas Shrugged. The story of Atlas Shrugged is heroes learning about the whole issue of moral sanction, of learning what it means to be on the side and fully on the side of the good, and learning what it means to not sanction, to not give one's moral approval and moral aid to evil in any form or in any way. The whole um, plot device of the strike centers around the issue of moral sanction. So it's integral to the story of Atlas Shrugged, but it's featured in all four of Ayn Rand's novels, in We the Living, in Anthem, in The Fountainhead, because all in various ways are stories about the conflict between good and evil. And a central element of Ayn Rand's thought about that conflict is that um, evil gains its, I'll put it this way, it gains its world-shaping power through the aid, the approval, the moral sanction of the good. So this is, it's a really important issue in objectivism. The genesis for my talk, the reason I wanted to uh, speak about this this year, is that when I discuss the issue with, of moral sanction with people, I often feel like I'm approaching it from a different perspective, or we have very different perspectives on the whole approach to the issue of moral sanction. Um, and it's an issue that is hard to avoid. That is, if you're discussing issues, moral issues, cultural issues, the issue of moral sanction is difficult to avoid. It's not always named as it's an issue of sanction, of moral aid, of moral approval, but it's all over today's cultural issues and debates. And let me just take sort of a sampling. Confederate statues, flags, monuments in government buildings, streets and parks and schools named after Confederate generals. Do they or don't they give some kind of sanction, some kind of moral approval to the Confederacy and what it stood for? It's an issue of sanction. A very different kind of issue. O.J. Simpson. He recently died a few months ago, and my attitude towards that is good riddance. <clears throat> now, for those who don't know, who weren't around at the time, his trial for murder was front page news. It was the headlines day after day, week after week. The trial galvanized the nation. There were cameras in the courtrooms. Um, and I think, at least a majority, and probably a sizable majority of people who followed the trial thought the evidence presented in court was sufficient to convict um, uh, and indict Simpson of murder. It was sufficient to prove that he murdered beyond a reasonable doubt. But the jury acquitted him. And afterwards, people faced the issue of, do you deal with O.J. Simpson? He's been declared not guilty but friends, colleagues, do you deal with him? After he was a, a star athlete in football, but then he became a sports commentator. Do you have him back in the booth? And people, they, they really grappled with this question. Can you say you're against murder and then put O.J. Simpson back in the booth? That's an issue of sanction. A different kind of example, the intellectual dark web and it's splitting apart. So these are people like Sam Harris, Jordan Peterson, Brett Weinstein, they came together um, as a group in, in basically because they had or seemed to have common enemies who were ostracizing them. And they even reported like, they became friends, as, at least some of them, as a result of this. But then as it went on, there became more and more an issue of, well, what do we actually agree about? And then it became, am I giving my sanction, my moral approval to views that I think are really wrong, maybe even irrational and destructive. You can see this in, around COVID and debates within the intellectual dark web of COVID, vaccines, and it's split apart. 
And it split apart because I think the basic answer of at least many of the people is, no, I can't keep giving my sanction to this. Tucker Carlson's interview of Putin. Was it a sanctioning of a dictator and a mass murderer? Fossil fuel companies and climate change. Should you give your moral sanction, your moral approval to the companies, as, say, Alex Epstein is doing in his work at the Center for Industrial Progress? Or should you give your sanction to their enemies and opponents, <clears throat> as almost everybody else in the world today will tell you to do? Sexual abuse crimes. Whether you look at Sandusky, that was the football coach at Penn State University, Weinstein in Hollywood, the Catholic Church and its widespread uh, abuse and rape of children. When you look at those and when you look at the details of these abuses, it seems, like take the church as an example, that there's massive sanctioning of the abuse, of the crimes, of higher officials looking the other way, trying to sweep things under the rug, reassigning priests to some other place where presumably they'll just commit the same crimes uh, with new victims. Enormous amount of sanctioning of that, um, if you look into the details of that. And if you ask, could any other institution have withstood that kind of uh, criminality within it other than the church? I'm pretty skeptical that any other institution could have. And why can the church? Is it because of the moral sanction that's given to religion in today's culture? So all over the place, when you're discussing moral issues, the issue of moral sanction is um, at the forefront. Not always named explicitly, but it's, it's, uh, it's immersed in these issues because the issue of are you taking a stand, and a stand fully on the side of the good and against evil, is a crucial moral issue. So it comes up in discussion all the time. And as I said, the genesis of the talk is the idea that um, I think of the issue in a different way. And it crystallized for me, and crystallized in my mind what that different way is by considering some of the criticisms of objectivism and objectivists on the issue of moral sanction. And there's a fair amount of criticism. I'll take a couple. Uh, Brian Kaplan, who's a free market economist, he has a piece, he criticizes the whole idea and issue of sanction, and particularly it's, it, the criticisms are focused on the idea of you can't sanction evil. He has a title, the title of one of his pieces is, quote, Sanction, the triumph of Ayn Rand's worst idea the triumph of her worst idea, sanction, close quote. <clears throat> so the idea of not sanctioning evil, and think of some of the examples that I listed before, of not sanctioning evil is Ayn Rand's worst idea. <clears throat> um, and when you look at the critics and the criticisms, there's a special target, and I think this special target is particularly revealing. There's a special target of you can't sanction the sanctioners of evil? And that's been taken from an article that Peter, Schwartz, Peter Schwartz wrote at the time of the split between ARI and David Kelly, sanctioning the sanctioners. And they, there's a special emphasis that there's something irrational about that idea, I mean, according to the critics. Uh, so you see this in Kap if you read Kaplan's article, he, he explicitly makes reference to this idea, quotes from Peter Schwartz's article, and thinks there's something crazy about this. Here's the writer Robert Trzinski, uh, quote, you shouldn't sanction evil, but you also shouldn't sanction the sanctioners? And what about the sanctioners of the sanctioners of the sanctioners? Close quote. <clears throat> now that's supposed to be some kind of reductio ad absurdum. It's, and what about the sanctioners of the sanctioners of the sanctioners of the sanctioners, and so on. <clears throat> There is something absurd in that criticism, but it's not the idea of sanctioning the sanctioners. <clears throat> um, I'm gonna, I'll come back to that at the end of the talk. Um, you can't understand October 7th and the aftermath if you don't think about the issue of sanctioning evil, 
of sanctioning the sanctioners and even of sanctioning the sanctioners of the sanctioners. And I'll come back to that. But what, what I concluded from like, reading and thinking about the nature of this kind of criticism, the alien approach, or the approach that I think is very different and wrong to, to the way I think about the issue of moral sanction, is that it's a religious approach. It's a religious approach to thinking about the issue of moral sanction. And the basic gist of my talk is I want to highlight some ways in which I think the religious approach um, to, to morality and to thinking about the issue of moral sanction colors or distorts thinking about the issue and then highlight in contrast um, some of the ways that I think is the right way to think about this issue. So it's about the, sort of the basic framing of thinking about the issue of moral sanction. Um, and th the idea that religion corrupts here, that it corrupts understanding and thinking about the issue of moral sanction, should not come as a big surprise. Religion corrupts and has corrupted every important moral issue. Um, the, the idea that religion has had a monopoly or a near monopoly on ethics means that it's, it's injected its mystical, arbitrary perspective on morality into our thinking. And it's done it on every issue, and it does it on the issue of moral sanction. So I'm going to highlight three aspects. And the, the basic point is not, is this how you think about the issue of moral sanction? It's rather, does this at all color the way that you think about the issue of moral sanction? It might not capture fully the whole way you think, but does it color? Because if it does, I think it's coloring in a way that is distorting, that, that, that is distracting from how to think about this and how to reach proper conclusions. Um, and the, the first way I'll put it, so again, and the issue is, does this influence your thinking at all? Does the issue of not sanctioning evil feel at all like a taboo? Just something you're not supposed to do. Don't have sex outside of marriage. Don't use electricity on Saturdays. Don't think you're good, even if you are. Don't eat pork. Don't sanction evil. It's just on a list of prohibitions that I can't do. <clears throat> it's this kind of untouchable thing that I'm not supposed to touch. This is the idea, and it comes a lot from religion, of morality as a nag. <clears throat> yeah, that pork chop over there looks good, but what can you do when you have to deal with morality? <clears throat> And if you read Kaplan's article, for instance, you'll see an element of this kind of thinking about the issue of sanction. So he was interested in objectivism at an early age. And he came across the issue of not sanctioning evil. This is in part in Ayn Rand's essay, How to Live a Rational Life in an Irrational Society. And the, like, part of the flavor of his article is because now he doesn't think of himself as an objectivist, I think it's, here come those objectivists again, about you can't sanction evil, and you can't sanction the sanctioners of evil, and so come, where will it end? And his translation of the idea was, I can't talk to anyone who I disagree with, and I can't talk to anyone who talks to anyone I disagree with, because that would be sanctioning the sanctioners, and I can't talk to anyone, da, 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 da. and then it was like, who can I talk to? Maybe a one objectivist I know, but if you don't know any objectivists, you can't talk to anybody. <clears throat> and if you ask, well, why can't you talk to people you disagree with or who say something you disapprove of, even morally disapprove of? Is an objectivist taboo? That's the basic answer, and that's a religious way of thinking. We've got a list of prohibitions, and that's what you've got to follow, and that's what you have to obey. So one, you can think of it, that's the first, of thinking of it as a taboo. The second way, uh, and these are not meant at all to be exhaustive, but a second way that I think the issue of religion um, influences thinking about the issue of moral sanction is if you equate in any way disagreement or disapproval, moral disagreement or moral disapproval with damnation, 
And you can see an element of that in the way Kaplan thinks about it. Like, if I disagree with someone, I can't talk to them. I can't deal with them. I, have, I just have to walk away. It's like the person is damned. It's like you're, you have to burn the heretic at the stake if you disagree. And in here, morally disagree. You have some kind of moral disagreement, moral disapproval. You have to burn the heretic at the stake. And this religion really inculcates this attitude. Um, and it inculcates it for a very definite reason, that there's no intermediate possibilities. The moment you see some, something um, that is, goes into the supposed category of evil, it's you burn the heretic at the stake. There's no intermediate possibilities, such as politely expressing disagreement or disapproval, or even um, sternly expressing moral disagreement or disapproval, but continuing the conversation. Like, that's not on Kaplan's radar when he was thinking about it. And I think it doesn't get on a person's radar for, uh, because of a religious approach to morality. Because religion qua faith-based, qua injecting the arbitrary and the mystical, really encourages the idea that proof of your loyalty to a rational, mystical, arbitrary code of morality, proof of your loyalty is to drive out any deviant, no matter how small the deviation. <clears throat> and if you look, for instance, at the, the conflicts and schisms in the church, it's amazing over what some of the, the disputes and disagreements are and that they'll split. If you take, for instance, what's called the Great Schism of 1054, this splits the church into its eastern half and its western Roman half. Some of the conflict is over such things as, in the Eucharist, do you have to use leavened bread or unleavened bread? I doubt yeast knows it's that important. <clears throat> but it's really not, in the end, a laughing matter, because these kinds of disputes led to murder, torture, war, death. But it's a religious kind of conception that to prove my loyalty, yeah, I'm going to use leavened bread. And anybody who uses unleavened bread, they're damned. They're a heretic, heretic to be burned at the stake. Religion encourages that as proof of your loyalty to the irrational. But it has nothing to do with a proper moral approach. And a third, so the, the second is uh, this kind of immediate equation of disagreement, um, disapproval with damnation. The third is if you at all think of negative moral judgment, moral criticism as cruel, you're being cruel, you're being cruel to the other person. That, I think, again, comes from religion and for a very understandable reason, again, from religion. <clears throat> if from a, from a, the perspective of religious morality, if you're criticizing somebody and saying, we are not living up to morality, and morality standards or requirements, that person, if he's at all healthy, will experience it as, why are you holding me up to these mystical, arbitrary moral standards? I've got to live. And it can experience it as, like, you're doing something bad, something wrong, something cruel to me by subjecting me to these moral standards. But again, from a proper perspective, it's not an expression of cruelty. It's an expression of kindness or of benevolence to hold somebody up to proper moral standards. <clears throat> and, it, and it's both to hold yourself and to hold other people up to proper moral standards. <clears throat> so a third way is this idea that um, the expression of moral criticism is cruel. And now I want to talk... So th these are three ways in which I think the issue of religion and a kind of religious approach to morality colors thinking about sanction, particularly the issue of not sanctioning evil. It gives it this kind of flavor, which is a flavor of the irrational, and then people rebel against it. So to think now of what a 
better or pr a proper approach on each of these issues. And I want to take the last that I brought up first. The idea that moral criticism is kind. And this is against the idea that, well, moral criticism should be unwelcome. It's an expression of cruelty against me. Um, it's threatening to me or to my self-image. It's counterproductive. Everybody's good or everybody's well-motivated um, <clears throat> all the time. I don't think any of that is true. And here's one way that I hold it. This is something of like what a counter perspective to this is. This is something that uh, John Allison said on sta at, a, at a stage on Ocon. It's got to now be more than a decade ago. He said, everybody of AIDS, everybody of AIDS, and then he added, even objectivist intellectuals. And I remember thinking at the time, well, that's pretty amusing, because as though intellectuals have some kind of uh, pass in regard to morality or not, are not subject to moral rules and moral principles and moral laws. But there was a reason, I think he said it at the time. Everybody evades, including objectivist intellectuals. But I want to focus on the issue. Everybody evades that occasionally, occasionally, we push things out of mind. We don't want to see it. We don't want to deal with it. There's something we don't want to face. We place some emotion above the facts <clears throat> in the moment and in a certain time. That everybody evades. Now, I don't mean by this at all that this is inborn. It's, you've got some inborn tendency. I don't mean at all this in a deterministic sense. And I certainly don't mean that everybody does it all the time. But I also would be suspicious of the idea of, if you hold this in any kind of way, of this, yeah, other people evade. I never do. <clears throat> I'd be suspicious of that idea. <clears throat> and in regard to morality, moral principles, moral standards, you need to call you, yourself out when you find you're evading something. When you think, yeah, I'm not really facing this, I'm not really thinking about this, I'm not really trying to deal with this, you need to call yourself out. <clears throat> Morality is about self-interest. It's something good to do that. You should want to live up to your moral principles, to your moral standards, to your moral code. And if you find in some way that you're not, or you're not in the moment, you should call yourself out. It's an expression of benevolence towards yourself to do that. You, and you should object, object to yourself when you think you're not fully living up to your moral principles. And a kind of corollary issue in life is that it's helpful to have other people do that. It's helpful to have other people call you out morally. And it's helpful in this particular, especially in this particular way, I think. I think there's an important moral issue in regard to evasion of pushing things out of mind, of not wanting to see, not wanting to deal with something, of when you find that that's what I'm doing, do you double down on the evasion? Do you start giving your some, yourself some kind of pseudo-story, pseudo-justification, <clears throat> engaging in some kind of pretense that, yeah, no, what I'm doing is all right, other people are the problem. The <clears throat> do you give yourself some, some kind of BS story or do you face, yeah, I'm not really thinking about this. I'm not really dealing with this. I need to do better in this regard. Do you double down on the evasion or do you face it? In Atlas Shrug, what you see and what it means that, that Jim Taggart, for instance, you can describe him as he's a chronic evader, is that he doubles down and triples down and quadruples down on his evasions. Even when he's being called out, even when Eddie Willers comes to his office and says, look, we've got real problems and you've got to deal with them. He invents all these pseudo justifications why there's no real problems on the rail line. So he's doubling down on his evasions. And that's what makes him a chronic evader. <clears throat> that you call yourself out or that you have other people who call yourself out. In effect, what they're saying or what they're encouraging you to do is don't double down. Don't double down here. I think you're not facing something. You're not dealing with something. You're evading something here. Don't double down on it. Face it. <clears throat> and it's, it, it's, I think it's an, it's, a, it's an important in issue in life to keep people around you um, in life who do that. 
who are willing to do that. Um, I mean, I can remember times, both as a child and as an adult, of being chewed out, chewed out morally by someone. And the idea that it's an expression of cruelty, that someone's doing something unkind or cruel to me, I find, I really think of it as bizarre. I mean, take, I'll take one as a, as a kid, so this is pre-discovering philosophy, objectivism. I mean, I can remember once, my dad didn't get mad very often. Um, I mean, like, really angry, but I can r remember one episode where he was livid. He was livid with me and our, uh, my two brothers um, because we were treating my mother in a disrespectful way. And the tone and nature of the conversation was not, oh, you're thinking about this incorrectly, and you know, you're making a mistake here, and you need to... It was, no, you guys are being complete jackasses. And we were, and I remember the three of us just sitting there not saying a word, partly because we'd never seen him that mad, but partly because we all knew he was right. We were behaving like jackasses. And the idea that of somebody calling you out on that and saying, no, you need to stop doing this, I expect better from you. And this is part of the, what it, why it's an issue of kindness or benevolence. When it comes from a place of, I expect better from you, I, what you're doing in the moment isn't what you really are. You can and should be doing better than this. That's an expression of goodwill, of benevolence towards the other person, not an expression of cruelty. <clears throat> and I, mean, I, can, I can recall many episodes like that, but I'll take as a kind of wider phenomenon, because this is a phenomenon that's been noticed uh, in a certain way by a lot of people and who have commented on this. And take it as highly successful people who achieve, in effect, a celebrity status, whether it's like everybody would know their name or in some particular uh, area or subdomain, people would know, the, everybody knows them. They've achieved a real success and a celebrity status. There's an issue of, uh, that, as I say, people note and have commented on. Do they keep around them any of their old friends or family members? And it's usually a bad sign if they don't. Now, it's not always a bad sign if they don't. I mean, if they have a bad family, if you have a family like Cheryl's in Atlas Shrug, yeah, you should try to get away from them. So, but it's usually a bad sign, because what they've done, usually, is surrounded themselves with yes-men and sycophants people who will always tell them what they want to hear, and in particular, people who will never call them out morally and say you're doing something wrong. One of the ways they'll be described in the, in, in, in when people talk about this is they're enablers. But what, they're, like, what is it that they're enabling? They're enabling the person to double down on their evasions, of telling, oh, yeah, you didn't do anything wrong, it was other people, they were trying to screw you, that, or, it, and, and they feed them the story of help. They, what they're doing is helping them feed a pseudo-justification, a pseudo-rationalization for their evasions. They're enablers, uh, rather than that they have the willingness and the courage to call the person out and say, no, here I think you're functioning incorrectly. This is widely noted, for instance, for sports figures. Um, when, when they sort of attain the top of their profession. I can remember, I'm Canadian, so when I think of sports, I think of hockey. Um, <clears throat> Wayne Gretzky, I mean, for a decade or more, he was the best player in the sport and one of the best athletes in the world, I think, and when you see how much better he was than the second person in his sport. Um, and you could see elements of the, f and here's another way to colloquially be put, the fame going to his head that I never do anything wrong, I'm at the top, just because he's the best player in the sport, like it, though he can never do anything wrong. And people commented at the time that he kept his father around, Walter Gretzky. Um, and his father, by all accounts, is a, a really decent person. And you could see that his father was a check on him. His father, like his father was not an enabler, and it's because he doesn't think of him as a celebrity that I've got a kowtow to. He's just a, somebody I raised and was willing, once he achieved fame, of, yeah, you can still 
treat people disrespectfully, and if you do that, you're not going to get criticism in regard to that. And it spoke well of Wayne Gretzky that he kept his father around, <clears throat> and, that, and he wanted him in his professional life. So if morality is about self-interest, it's important that you call yourself out morally when you think you've done something wrong. But it's important also to have people around you who are willing to do that. And the idea that moral criticism is an expression then of cruelty, I think it's the exact reverse, or at least it can be and should be. And if you're coming from a right place in regard to this, it should be. It, you're doing it from the perspective of the person can do better and you expect them to do better. And that's helpful for the other person's functioning if they take it seriously. So it's benevolent to hold people up, both yourself and other people up, to rational moral standards. <clears throat> so that if there's any element of thinking, well, don't, I can't sanction evil, and that means I've got to voice disapproval, and, so, and that's cruel, and I want to be kind, benevolent, and this is one of the ways that it's put by critics of objectivism. It's not true. It's not true at all. A second issue, uh, to take the, the uh, the, the issue of thinking of it as a taboo. Part of that, I think, comes from the issue of thinking of the moral sanction too much from the perspective of the negative or of the evil. And so it becomes a taboo that you can't violate. One should think of it as a quest for the positive. The issue of moral sanction, including the issue of not sanctioning evil, should all be animated from the quest to achieve values, to achieve the good, and that it's a means to achieving the good, to achieving values. It's not some kind of end in itself. So the fundamental in life and for all moral issues is about the positive, about the pursuit of values, the pursuit of good. And so the, for the issue of moral sanction, the primary issue in, in thinking about this and one's focus should be, am I on the side of the good? really, in action, publicly when necessary. And then, as a corollary, an important corollary, but only a corollary, am I on the side of the bad in any way? In action. <clears throat> and that from the other side, am I against the bad, really, in action, publicly when necessary? But the primary, um, even when there's an issue of not sanctioning, of speaking up against evil, the primary motivation should be, it's in the name of the good. It's in the name of the good. And I'll illustrate this with two episodes from our public advocacy since I've been at ARI. And I'm partly using this as an example, because we're often asked, why are you guys so negative? Why are you focused on evil? And that's not how I experience at all what we do in the public advocacy uh, at ARI, even though we do talk about the issue of evil, and we talk about it a fair amount. But it's not a primary. So take the 9-11. We put a lot of intellectual energy, speaking, writing, doing media interviews around the, uh, in, in, in the aftermath of 9-11. But it wasn't so because we loved attacking and denouncing George W. Bush. It came from a positive. It came from the orientation of who's going to speak for America? Who's going to speak for American ideals, American values, American self-defense? And our answer at the Institute, and unfortunately I think we were right, is nobody. Or nobody's going to do it well. And if we don't do it at the Institute, nobody's going to do it. And it was so, I, the issues at play and that the good is going to be undermined if the response to 9-11 is the disaster that it came to be. That was the whole focus. And then there, that involves a lot of criticism of what the Bush administration did, what its foreign policy was. But it's not a primary. The primary is there was something good there that needed approval, sanction, aid. It needed somebody to speak up for it. Um, and nobody would do that. And that's, what, so th that's why we set out to do it. it was, um, I, as I say, we, I mean, we spent years and years on that. 
Or take another episode somewhat related, the Danish cartoons. We spent a lot of time on that issue. We displayed the cartoons when most people would not. But it was not to rub it at them in the face of Muslims. It was, there was something good, important here, to stand up for, to defend. <clears throat> um, and again, that so few people were doing it. It was good for the newspaper and its editor, Fleming Rose, to publish the cartoons. He had the courage to try to um, sort of expose the self-censorship around Islam that existed and continues to exist in Europe and I think in North America as well. To try to expose that and to make it a topic, like is this right, to make it a topic of conversation. There was something good there that needed defense, approval, sanction. And all he was getting, and all the newspaper got, and all Denmark got, was outright condemnation. And again, it was important to stand up for that. It's a corollary, an important corollary, to then denounce the barbarians who are rioting around the world. And if you can remember that episode, that's a literal, something that literally happened. The, 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 I mean, they might not call themselves barbarians, but they were barbarians rioting around the world. And you had to denounce what was fueling that, which was Islamic totalitarianism. But it's not an end in itself. It's in the name of pursuing, defending, upholding the good. And that should be one's whole orientation towards the issue of sanction. It's the same for October 7th. The basic and fundamental issue is to be pro-Israel to be pro a good and free country in a sea of dictatorships and tyrannies. It's a secondary and important issue to be anti-Hamas, but the primary is to be pro-Israel when it's being attacked and when it's being denounced. Uh, and so what should animate you is not there's some kind of taboo I can't touch or something. It's this is all in the name of trying to pursue and achieve a positive. And then on the third issue of trying to, again, this is all in, in one way of, you can think of it as freeing oneself from the kind of religious perspective. That what, if one equates disapproval, disagreement with damnation, the real alternative is not a knee-jerk reaction of burn the heretic at the stake, but careful thinking about the causal and moral responsibility involved of the people involved. <clears throat> um, and this is an issue that is featured in At the Shrugged, and I'll talk about that in a moment. But last year, in my Ocon talk, I talked briefly about the issues of errors of knowledge versus breaches of morality. This is an important, very important distinction that Ayn Rand makes in At the Shrugged. It's in Galt's speech. I think one of the ways Galt puts it is, make every allowance for errors of knowledge. Do not accept any breach of morality. So an error of knowledge is you're just ignorant of something, you're making a mistake, you're misapplying an idea, a concept, a principle. A breach of morality is when you're pushing your knowledge aside, when you're working not to see something. You don't want to know, you don't want to face it, because it might require you to do something or to take a stand that you will find uncomfortable to do or to take. And so you don't want to see. Willful blindness is one of the ways Galtz puts it in his speech. That's a breach of morality, not an error. It's not just error or ignorance. It's you're working not to see something. And I said last time, and you can look up that talk, it's on YouTube for a little bit more on this, that there's an important subcategory to think about in regard to errors of knowledge and breaches of morality. And that's the, that objectivism views morality, ethics, as a science, as a body of knowledge, like chemistry. And just as you can be ignorant of some idea or principle in chemistry or can be misapplying it, so you can be ignorant of some idea in morality or be misapplying some moral idea, moral principle, moral concept. So there's errors of moral knowledge, but there's also breaches of moral knowledge where you're pushing your knowledge about morality and about good and evil aside 
because you don't want to deal with something, you don't want to face something in reality. And one of the reasons that distinction, that sort of subcategory, is important is it's important to the whole story and conflict in Atlas Shrugged, particularly around the issue of sanction. And one of the ways to put it is there's a difference between causal and moral responsibility, even though there's a relationship between these two. So you can be giving your moral approval, moral aid, moral sanction to evil, to the bad, through an error of moral knowledge. Or you can be doing it through a breach of your moral knowledge. And causally, you're doing something very similar. In both situations, you're giving actual aid, support to evil. But in the one case, it's an error of moral knowledge. In the other, it's a breach of the person's moral knowledge. And that has all kinds of ramifications and action implications in terms of thinking how you deal with the other person. <clears throat> and this is part of it. it. It's just not, oh, it's damnation the moment I see there, they have some hands and some sanctioning of evil. And where this is most featured in Atlas Shrugged is in regard to Galt and two significant people in his life, Dagny and Robert Stadler. In one conversation between Galt and Dagny, he says to Dagny, you're my worst enemy but one. And she asks, who's your worst enemy? And he says, Dr. Robert Stadler. And then he, and then he says, quote, he's the man who sold his soul. Close quote. And from one perspective, there's something similar about Dagny and Stadler. They're both on the side of aiding, abetting, giving their sanction to evil. They're both doing that. That's part of the, the whole issue of Dagny's not yet on strike. That means she's on the side of the moochers and the looters. But hers is an error of moral knowledge. She's ignorant and can't fully understand the full nature and depth like sort of the abyss of evil. She can't fathom the idea of hatred of the good for being the good. She can't understand that as the animating motivation, the motivational structure for her brother, Jim Taggart, that what he's motivated by is hatred of the good for being the good. She's ignorant, makes an error in regard to that. But she's still helping prop up Jim. And you see that throughout the stories. Uh, he becomes CEO of Taggart Transcontinental, basically only because of her. So she's, in, from one sense, a causal perspective on the side of propping up evil, of sanctioning it, of giving it moral support and moral aid. But she's nothing like Stadler, because Stadler's, so even though they're both giving causal support to evil, Stadler's is not an error of moral knowledge. Stadler is pushing aside his knowledge of right and wrong because he wants a laboratory and to continue his research, period. How is he going to pay for it? Does it provide any value to anybody else? That's somebody else's problem. I want a laboratory and I want to be able to do research and I want it now. <clears throat> And so he shunts aside the whole nature of the State Science Institute, of what it means that when they put out the, the statement that is sort of condemning Reardon Meadow but doesn't take any position. He knows it's irrational and so on. He won't stand up against it. That's not an error of moral knowledge. He knows it's irrational and yet won't take a stand. His is a breach of his moral knowledge. And when Galt describes it, he sold his soul. That's what it means. And as against, if you think how different Galt's attitude towards the two are, he's desperately trying to get Dagny into the valley. For Stadler, it's, we won't be reclaiming him, is one of the ways Galt puts it. <clears throat> Stadler is damned. Dagny's not. <clears throat> but so you can't have just this kind of knee-jerk reaction to, oh, they're involved in evil, they're sanctioning it, that means damnation. You have to think carefully 
about what is going on and the causal and the moral responsibility. And that kind of issue that's dramatized in Atlas Shrugged comes up a fair, fairly often, I think, in life, that where you have to think about the, the, the status of your knowledge, the status of other people's knowledge, and then to think carefully about, am I dealing, even when I think they're on the side of evil, that they're causally supporting evil? What's the moral responsibility involved? And you have to think a lot about this issue. Take one example, and then I'll come to the, the major example. Uh, of a person, I think many of us know something about, Bernie Madoff. That he was the investor who was a fraudster. I mean, his whole investment scheme was fraudulent. Now, some people knew, or strongly suspected, but some people even knew, long before he was caught, that he was a fraudster. <clears throat> that there's no way his investment claims and so add up. If that's the state of your knowledge, it has real implications. You can't go to banquets that are honoring Madoff. You can't go to award ceremonies where he's being presented with a gift. You can't appear on a panel with him where you're, it's three or four people just discussing different investment strategies. Not if you know he's a fraud, <clears throat> because you become then an accessory to the fraud. You're aiding him in covering up and pretending that he's a legitimate, serious investor. If you're on a panel with him and there's three other serious investors and Bernie Madoff, you're giving him your sanction and your approval when you know he's a fraud. And that remains true even if your colleagues are telling you you're nuts, you're being moralistic, you're being judgmental, Everybody knows Madoff's a great guy and respected in the profession. Who are you to say he's not? <clears throat> Even if your colleagues do that, you still can't be on panels with him um, or go to a banquet in his honor. And you don't have to condemn your colleagues. So this is the idea. It, it, the, the response isn't damnation of your colleague. Even if they're thinking like, you're being judgmental, moralistic, it doesn't have to be damnation. You might think that some of your colleagues are just ignorant. They've been taken in by Madoff's fraud. They haven't seen what you've seen. They haven't thought enough about what is doing and what is going on. Does it add up? They're ignorant. They're making a mistake. They're still on the side of evil. And they're still causally helping to prop up Madoff if they appear on panels with him, if they go to banquets in his honor. But you might think of some of your colleagues that it's not just there's a causal responsibility, but there's some moral responsibility. That they don't, they may have got a glimpse that, yeah, the numbers seem a little funny and maybe they don't add up, but they don't want to look too closely at it. Because they don't want to be, for instance, in a position where they might come to the conclusion, yeah, he is a fraud. And I can't then be on panels with him and go to banquets in his honor. And, so, and I don't want that. I don't want to stick out like that. So I'm not, yeah, there might be some, I'm not going to look too closely. And so then I don't know. And there you might think, yeah, there's causal responsibility in helping to prop up Madoff, but there's also some moral responsibility. But you have to think carefully about those kinds of issues to think what is the proper response. And even for a colleague like that, I don't think it's damnation. It's to call them out and say, um, you know, you've got a glimpse of that something doesn't seem right. You should really look into that more before you go on a panel with him or appear, uh, go to a banquet in his honor. You should look into it and not just brush it aside. You can tell that to your colleague. <clears throat> but the, the, the part of it, like, this requires careful thinking versus what religion encourages is knee-jerk reactions and unthinking responses. And if, if you think of the, this issue of causal versus moral responsibility, of a colleague, and take the Madoff case, who um, was ignorant, <clears throat> thought Madoff's a good guy and a good investor, and then discovers when it, it comes out, oh, that he's a complete fraud. That kind of person, if they're a good person, will think a lot about that. So they'll feel, yeah, I was partly causally responsible 
for helping to prop him up. If I appeared on panels with him and so on, I was one of the people giving him a kind of cover and respectability. And if they're a good person, they'll think, was it just that I was causally responsible? Was I just ignorant and fooled, taken in by the fraud? Or could I have known? Should I have known? Did I look the other way a little bit? Did I not want to see? And their answer might be, no, I didn't. But any good person will think about that when they find, yeah, I'm causally responsible. I've had my hands in helping to prop up evil. Um, and then discovering, when discovering that fact, it should be disturbing. And it should be something one thinks a lot about. Um, <clears throat> And as I say, judgment can be, like in Dagny's case, yeah, I just was ignorant, I was mistaken. But sometimes it will be, no, I was kind of looking the other way because I didn't fully want to know, and I need to do better next time. So on all three of these issues, there's a religious approach that taints the whole thinking about moral sanction, about not sanctioning evil, that puts it or gives it a color of the irrational. And the, when you read the critics of objectivism on this issue and of objectivists, it always has this flavor. They're being moralistic, judgmental, dogmatic. It's always, the, and dogmatic is the giveaway, that it's viewed as there's a religious mentality here. But it's actually them who are thinking about the issue in religious ways and then rebelling against it. It's not what objectivism teaches you in regard to thinking about and thinking carefully about issues of moral sanction. <clears throat> okay, now as a last issue, I'd say I'd come back to the issue of sanctioning the sanctioners. And I said that's the giveaway that you're dealing with a religious mentality when it's, okay, maybe there's an issue about sanctioning evil, but sanctioning the sanctioners? Now we've gone off the deep end and we're in irrational territory, which means religious territory. And you, I think of it like this, and I think this, this is uh, it's, um, an accurate analogy. Suppose a religion put a taboo on eating anchovies. You can't eat anchovies. Well, what about squid? Squid eats anchovies, so I'm, aren't I indirectly eating anchovies and tainting myself? And what about tuna, which eats squid, which eats anchovies? Is that off limits? And what about shark that eats tuna? Maybe the whole realm of seafood is off limits. That's how they think of the issue of sanctioning, sanctioning the sanctioners, sanctioning the sanctioners, of the sanctioners. It's like this religious taboo or mystical contagion that just passed on. And like, how can that be? And isn't this crazy? And doesn't it cut you off from everything if you do that? And if that's the way you think of it, it does cut you off from a lot of things. It is an irrational way to think of it, but that's the way that they're thinking of it. it uh, another way to put it is in terms, there's an untouchable thing. And then have you touched the thing that touched the untouchable thing? And then have you touched the thing that touched the thing that touched the untouchable thing? And if you've had any exposure to the issue of untouchables in India, they think like that. <clears throat> but that's a completely religious way of thinking about the issue of moral sanction. And if you step outside the world of religious taboos, the issue of thinking about the sanctioning of evil, thinking about the sanctioners of the sanctioners of evil, of thinking about sanctioners of sanctioners of sanctioners of evil, is a real and important issue to think about, to take stands on, and to understand the, as I'll put it, the endurance of evil. And nothing, there, there can't be a more powerful, it's a depressing, but a powerful example of this than October 7th and its aftermath. So, and, and think of some of these issues and their application. The primary, as I said, in regard to October 7th, is to be on the side of Israel, to be pro-Israel, to be pro-Israeli self-defense, to stand up for Israel. That's the primary. But you have to stand up for them because they're uh, in the midst of being attacked by an enormous evil. So you have Hamas, who are mass murderers, 
who've been committed since inception to wiping out Israel. Their motivation is to wipe out Israel because it's good. It's hard to think of getting a clearer example of hatred of the good for being the good as animating a whole cause, movement, and organization. This is the depth of evil, and it has to be thought of um, in that way, and it cannot be sanctioned in any way. <clears throat> but then you had Hamas's sanctioners. This is the student, uh, if we take just the U.S., the, the student protesters uh, around the world. It's more than just students, and even in the U.S., it's more than just students. The student groups and protesters whose immediate reaction to October 7th, to the attacks, to the mass murder, is to side with the mass murderers, to attack and blame Israel and try to whitewash and excuse, uh, and excuse Hamas. This, it was an enormous evil that was going on. And it, but it, what, the evil is that they're sanctioning Hamas. And Hamas took notice of this, of the fact, oh yeah, we seem to have some real approval and we praise the students who understand that our cause is legitimate and so on. <clears throat> they took, it's, it's part of what it means that when you sanction evil, you empower it, um, you give it confidence. <clears throat> So there was an enormous evil here in the sanctioning of the evil. Then you had the sanctioners of the sanctioners. You had the university presidents and administration and their statements after uh, October 7th, and then when they were uh, brought before Congress to testify, and that their performance was so abysmal. <clears throat> that people thought, right, and they might not put it like this, but they thought of it, in effect, in this way, that aren't they giving some kind of cover and moral approval to these students, groups, and protesters who are on the side of Hamas and against Israel? <clears throat> and they certainly were. I mean, when they testified before uh, uh, Congress, they're trying to hide behind the issue of free speech, of, well, what are we going to do on campus? Students have free speech, so we can't tell them what to say. <clears throat> now, if you leave aside whether they actually care about free speech on campus, that was such a whitewashing and a smokescreen for what the real issue was for them as university presidents and educators. The issue was, how can this be the response of your students? How the hell can it be that after somebody perpetrates mass murder, your students are siding with the mass murderers? What have they been taught in their classrooms? What kind of professors teaching what kind of courses do you have going on at your university that you've helped bring into existence and into power? That's what the issue was. <clears throat> and the issue of free speech, they're just hiding behind it because they don't want to face that issue. And the, the, how they conveyed um, that they, there was no deep um, thinking about this issue, no soul searching, that, I mean, any decent person, if you're a university president, should have been hor horrified by these protests and should have had this question. They don't need someone to ask them. They should have had the question, like, how can this be happening on our campus? And it was so glaring that they don't have that as a question. <clears throat> so they were sanctioners of the sanctioners. And then you had sanctioners of the sanctioners of the sanctioners. These were the billionaires who were funding the universities, <clears throat> helping these presidents stay presidents and in existence. And, and, I mean, this was a really good thing for a number of these people the aftermath of October 7th was a real wake-up call. It was, I'm sanctioning, I'm giving my moral aid, approval, and financial aid to university presidents and administrations, which are sanctioning these student protesters and groups, which are sanctioning the enormous evil of Hamas. And they rightly thought of themselves, because they are, as we're partly causally responsible for this. We've helped make this happen in a causal way, and they have, and you can't escape that. And then there's a question of, yeah, do we bear moral responsibility? 
And for the better of them, the fact that they started withdrawing their funding, demanding that the presidents uh, resign or be fired, was if we continue to do this, then we're morally responsible. It might have only been we were causally responsible, we were ignorant of what was going on on campuses. This is part of that, it's a wake-up call for them. We were ignorant, we had a good experience at the university, and so we support our alma mater, and we think it's, well, it must be basically good, and so on. And then they see, well, really, this is what's happening on campus, and the whole performance of the student groups and the administration and the presidents, it's, they rightly think of themselves as they're the sanctioners of the sanctioners of the sanctioners, and that they were doing something really wrong, and they're trying to self-correct, and that it's a, it's a really good thing that they're trying to self-correct. And they might view themselves, and I view many of them as, they were taken in by this, they're causally responsible, and you can't escape that, but they're not morally responsible, at least some of them aren't. Some of them probably knew more about what is being taught on campuses and so on. But some of them, what you see now, for instance, is they're taking deeper dives into what really is being taught on campuses? What is DEI? What is being taught in the classroom? And they're more and more horrified by what is taught. But you can't, like, you can't understand the issue of what is going on um, if you don't think of, the, like, there's these categories, and they're all really important categories of the, the perpetrators of the evil, but the sanctioners, the sanctioners of the sanctioners, and the sanctioners of the sanctioners of the sanctioners. For each of the cases, you have to think, you can't just have a knee-jerk reaction of, well, damn everybody here. You have to think morally about what is going on. So for instance, for the student protesters, some I think of them as they're vile and vicious. They know what Hamas is, they know what it stands for, they know its program since inception is to wipe out Israel, um, they know that nobody's free in Gaza, that it's, a, it's basically a dictatorship, and yet they side with Hamas anyway. Or not, it's not really anyway. They side with Hamas because of that. There's a real kind of nihilism involved in some of the student group's leaders, so some of these protesters. But for some of them, when you see what is going on, it, they're more clueless. They don't know what Hamas is. They can't find Israel on a map the chance of, to the river, to the, from the river to the sea. They don't know what it means. They've joined, it's not good that they've joined the protest, but it's not the abysmal evil of the people who know what Hamas is and are siding with them because of what Hamas is. So even within the student groups and protesters, you can't have just one reaction and like, damn everybody. And for some of these students, and this is part of what is so abysmal about the university's responses, what they would need is to be morally chewed out. That you don't fully know what you're doing, but what you're doing is aiding and abetting evil. You should not be taking stands like this when you don't know anything about the issue and your kind of knee-jerk reaction is to side with the losers. Um, there's something that you're doing that's really morally wrong and has all kinds of detrimental consequences. They, like, if they had real educators and real professors, that's what the educators and professors would be doing. And not just, oh, you're making a thinking mistake and a logical error. No, you're making, you're doing something morally wrong. And you don't have to damn them and not like, I'll never talk to you again. So, but they need to be called out. And part of the atmosphere is nobody will call them out um, on the, I mean, it certainly seems like that on the campuses. If you take the issue of sanctioners of the sanctioners, I view some of the university presidents and administration as worse than the student protesters. Because some of the student protesters have a kind of excuse of ignorance, of miseducation, because of how hopeless what they get in their classrooms is today. The presidents don't have an excuse of, we don't know what Hamas is, um, we don't know what Israel is, we don't know that Israel's a free country, and what uh, Hamas, the minute they get into power, what they institute is a dictatorship. They don't have the excuse of ignorance, or if they're that ignorant, they can't be a university president. <coughs> <coughs> and if you think then of the moral estimate of what I talked about of sanctioners of the sanctioners of the sanctioners, here I view it that the many of these billionaires, it's, they're way less morally responsible and some, maybe none. It's that they've causally propped these up, but the fact that they're questioning it, and it's a wake-up call, it's like that speaks well 
of them and what they're doing. And so the idea that it's like you just have this blanket reaction that you damn everything because every, all these people are in one sense on the side of evil, that's not real moral evaluation, real moral estimate. It's not what the issue of moral sanction is actually about in a non-religious context. And let me just say this, as, as, uh, if we zoom out a little bit from October 7th and think of the issue of sanctioning the sanctioners, I don't think you can understand the endurance of any evil, endurance over a period of time, if you don't pay attention to the issue of their sanctioners of the evil, their sanctioners of the sanctioners, their sanctioners of the sanctioners of the sanctioners. There's a whole environment, uh, uh, an environment that is, enables immorality, evasion, vice. It's really an environment of enablers, and that's what this is in the end. Of it, it's all kinds of people in various ways looking the other way. They don't want to see, they don't want to know. If you look at Nazi Germany, if you look at what happens in the church with the sexual abuse scandals, the amount of people who know something and don't do anything. <clears throat> um, if you look at, if you read about the Sandusky case at Penn State, Weinstein in Hollywood, the amount of people who know something um, and, well, these are our higher-ups, who are we going to question them? And so the, the amount of evasion and of sanctioning of the evil and sanctioning of the sanctioners, that's what the atmosphere is. That's how it um, is able to continue for so long. And so the, the idea of the sanctioning of the sanctioners, that that's some kind of weird fetish of objectivist, and like how... How can this be? And that's what the, uh, the Kaplan's, Trzinski's criticism, that's the kind of criticism, it, like, that's the flavor of the criticism. It's you just don't understand moral issues and the nature of morality, both on the side of the good and why the good requires consistency and all the ways in which for evil to endure, it requires sanction. Okay, let me... Uh, and there, so, and just to wrap up, so the basic point is that if you take the good seriously, you have to take the issue of moral sanction seriously. And that includes the issue of not sanctioning evil and not sanctioning the sanctioners of evil. But to really take it seriously and to think seriously about it, you have to jettison any remnant of the religious approach to thinking about morality and the issue of moral sanction and of evil and replace it with a proper self-interested approach. And that's what objectivism is encouraging us to do. Thanks and questions. Thank you. Yes, go ahead. Uh, I'm not used to being first in the line. This is kind of odd. Um, thank you very There's much. There's a first for everything. <laughs> thank you very much for the talk. Um, and, and I think you asked a really, really interesting question earlier in it um, about what group has been more forgiven for the horrors of pedophilia than the Catholic Church. And I think maybe one good answer that might be worth th thought is uh, the public school system. Um, there's one. Um, my question is... And, and maybe this is not even a fair question because you probably don't have time to give a, an appropriate answer, but anything you have would be greatly appreciated. If we're trying to determine who we give our moral sanction to and who we take our moral sanction away from, do you have an intellectual device that can be used when that becomes a little bit murky, when it's not as clear as taking moral sanction away from um, Epstein or... or, or, um, or well, uh, the very clear bad people. What was the name? You, did you say Epstein? Is that? Yeah, um, and and those that were around him. Like that's a very clear. Okay, moral sanction away from those people, especially groups. Um, it can be tricky to know when am I just disagreeing with a group or when I need to retract my moral sanction from them. So, do you have any intellectual device that could be used to make that more efficient and more objective? Does that make sense? 
Uh, yeah, so let, let me, on the, on the first comment you made about, I asked in regard to the church, what other institution could withstand this, and scandal is way too uh, weak a term, to, uh, what happened over decades and decades and decades in the church. And I said, it's without the moral sanction that religion gets. Yeah, the other, you brought up public schools, but I would put more broadly, is government. Government can do this, particularly if they were doing it in the name of some altruistic cause. So the difference between the condemnation of the Nazis and that communism can endure as a respectable thing to this day, and if someone says they're a communist, people don't think, they don't, they don't process it, like, well, you're a Nazi? And, it, it, and, the, so it's, and it's because of the sanction that communism gets. And so government can get this, and it gets it in various kinds of ways. So that's the other institution. Um, and there, for instance, in Canada, there's like incredible um, instances of, um, these were public government religious schools um, tremendous crimes at those schools against native children, for instance. And they have the double protection of religion and government. Um, <clears throat> on the, so you asked, uh, yeah, you, you have on s some guidelines here. You have to think about the nature of the evil um, the, and, and its severity, the degree of it. That's part of what is involved. There's certain evils that you really ha you have to withdraw from. There's not an issue of just expressing disagreement, disapproval, but that you can somehow continue the relationship. So you have to think a lot about what the nature of the evil is. But I would say there's a reason that in Ayn Rand in her essay of how does one live a rational life in an irrational society, that the advice she gives is to speak up and to voice your disapproval. Um, that she really focuses on that advice is, I think, telling, because it's easier to do than one thinks, and it's more powerful to do than one thinks. Just the expression of, I disagree with something you're doing here. I morally, morally disagree. I think there's something wrong, destructive, destructive to life, about that. to really voice that when you think that is happening. And it doesn't mean, as I said, that you have to damn the person it doesn't mean you have to necessarily disconnect and disassociate completely. That matters a lot with the degree of the evil. But voicing it is really, really, really important. And there's a tendency to think of that um, one's making oneself a martyr. And there are situations in which one can make oneself a martyr, um, particularly when you're dealing with government and government evils. But there are fewer than what I think people think. Um, it serves as a kind of excuse. Well, I don't want to be a martyr, so I'm not going to speak up here. I'm not going to challenge this. And you should speak up and you should challenge. And part of that I said, you can do it in a respectful, I mean, depending on the content, if it's warned, in a respectful way, in a polite way, in a stern way, but nevertheless conveying, like, I'm not writing you off just because of this, but there's something here that's going on that I think is really wrong. It's really important to do that. It's a great answer, thank you. So in recent years and certainly in recent months, I'm increasingly concluding that you can't um, avoid being like friends with someone who's friends with just the worst people around, uh, certainly in public life. So if you're gonna be involved in public life, if you're gonna interact with either political camp or go on any popular podcast, you're friends with someone who's friends with a uh, literal Nazi or a Hamas supporter. It's just, it seems like you just can't get around it in today's uh, context in public life. And maybe the same um, dilemma applies also to private life, but when it comes to public life, I think that's just kind of the way it is now. And I'm wondering, do you see it the same way? How do the objectivists and ARI kind of think about how to kind of find their place in the world today and to interact with people without sanctioning the sanctioners of just the worst of the worst. Yeah, it, it, there's not that kind of, part of what I was arguing is there's not that kind of simple transmission that you, so you have to think a lot, like what does it mean when you say they're friends with literal Nazis? Like what does that mean? Um, 
are they really friends or they've been at a con- they were at a conference together? Does he know that he's a Nazi? Like, yeah, and you have to think a lot about like, what is the actual relationship? But if I had, like I'm dealing with some people and the, the, I find, oh yeah, they've, they really hang out with Nazis and they, they seem affiliated with them. Yeah, I would think, I would disassociate the relationship. So you have to think what the actual relationships are and the degree of the evil involved. <clears throat> But I, like, I don't think it's true that if, if you just trace, you're going to always end up with the, the people who are um, involved in a way, and particularly in a knowing way, with all kinds of incredible evil. First, I'd like to say that the guy in front of me seems to be the only student that I have seen in 42 years of going to these conferences that knows how to use a microphone to point it at your mouth so that you can hear them. And I think a lot of people agree with me. All right. Now, I don't like the word sanction because it has controversial meanings. And I know we make it plain, but not everybody knows that sanctions also mean uh, saying good things about people. Uh, can you want to answer that at all, or no? Yeah, the, I mean, the typical use is sanction, or it's really usually the plur- plural, sanction. So imposing economic sanctions on Russia after they invaded Ukraine, of what happened with what Europe did. The typical use is it's sanction. And I mean, the two dictionary definitions, one then usually first will be to impose a penalty uh, or, or threaten a penalty on someone. And the second is to give official approval. And that's the use that it's been, I mean, when the issue of moral sanction in objectivism is primarily about the issue of what you give approval of aid to, but like that's, that is a use that people know. Um, so. It, yes, when I'm talking to non-objectivists, I will often make the, the sanction is a, one of the English words that has opposing meanings, um, but I didn't think it was necessary to do that here. Yeah, we have to make it uh, known as to which way you're using it. And the other thing I have to well, ask... Well, can, can we take your second question if you get uh, back in line? We have, it's a long line, so... That's why... I, it's just, it's just short, very short. Well, yeah, but is the answer short? Where was Iran? Where was Iran in all those sanctioners? Where was Iran? Well, this, the it country. wasn't country. Pardon? The country, Iran. Well, there wasn't an exhaustive list of all, everything that props up Hamas, so it was focused on the issue of the student protests. But yes, if you look at all, everything that props up Iran, I mean, Hamas, Iran is a major, major force there. And the way that we treat Iran in our foreign policy is part of what enables that. Yeah, Harry. Yeah, I thought it was a great talk, very clear. It touched on things that needed to be said and are not well understood. There was one thing you said that I disagreed with, if I understood it, and that's that everybody evades. Maybe you're talking about in some loose sense in which people don't give the attention to things that begin to worry them, so they kind of shy away temporarily from something like in procrastination. But if you mean hardcore evasion, uh, I don't think everybody evades. I don't think Ayn Rand evaded. So, do you want to clarify that? Yeah, I mean it in the first sense, and I, uh, well, I'd be interested in what you would describe as, har- like, how you would characterize hardcore evasion. But that, for me, that it's, that somebody's characteristically evading, or maybe just evading about this issue, this kind, and there, it, that's, for me, the issue of they're doubling down on their evasion. They might have pushed it away a little bit, but when they see, like, I was pushing this away, it's, they don't then deal with it, they don't face it, it's, oh, no, I was right to push it away, and, and they invent a story and a pretense. And that, like, so is that what you mean by hardcore evasion? Because that's what I mean by doubling down on an evasion. Now you're really solidifying it. This is something 
that I've pushed away and I'm protecting its status in effect as pushed away? Well, I don't disagree with that, but I think of it more as the act of denying reality to something that one knows is real. So uh, you, you tell yourself, no, this doesn't exist. This is not there. I, it, it's not real. Whereas uh, things like procrastination, uh, you, you say, well, I don't have to do it now. I have to do it, but I can wait a little longer. And that may not be quite kosher, and you may get a bad sense of it, uh, but that's not the, the same thing as saying, no, I'm not, it's not there. If I don't look at it, it won't be there. You're, you're kind of tabling it and pushing it off to the future. Uh, I, I don't think that's the same category. I think it's, you're starting to go down that road. Yes. And, that, so, and that's part of the issue of having people call you out, like that you're procrastinating, like you don't have a good reason for what you're doing. And the, like I used to have this, that I, I write papers better at last minute. That's BS. Yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and that, that, so that's the cut, that you're starting to go down that road. Yeah, I agree with yeah. that. Okay, right. We have a question from Charles. Do you have any recommendations for strengthening one's ability or muscle in standing up for one's values in daily life? Uh, yes, I think like with, and it's a good way to put it, of strengthening one's muscle. In most instances like that, I think it, you will usually do it by do it in relatively easy cases, low stakes. It's like starting an exercise program and don't start with the highest weights and the most repetitions. Start easy and until you get into the form of doing this. Part of what you have to do, to con what, part of what you're doing is convincing yourself that it's not the end of the world when you do this and far from it not being the end of the world, you'll find you're in supporting and helping your own values. That will be motivating. It'll be motivating to do it more, do it again, do it when it's higher stakes, um, do it when it seems scarier to do it. There's some people, the advice might be like it's, it's, it's pushing someone into the deep end of the pool, do it for something that is very challenging to you and threatening, but for most people I would say do it on little things and build up the muscle and then you'll be able to do it more and more and when it seems more difficult, when the emotional stakes are higher, it will be easier to do because you'll have formed that kind of habit and form to do it. Yeah. Hi, uh, question about the, uh, the, like the billionaire example. Uh, if you're like the friend of the billionaire, you have some kind so of... So if you're the friend of the billionaire? Yeah, or if you have some kind of positive relationship with him and you see that causally it's leading to this very bad things happening, you need to have that frank, honest, uh, perhaps stern conversation, all because you want him to be better so that then the friendship is better and then causally the, education, uh, the school is better and then the water is better and you live in the world. My question is, would it be correct in saying that you need to do that, but not need in the nagging sense, but need in that because you're on the premise of I want to make the most of my relationships, I need to let him know, I need him to know this. Um, what do you think? Yeah, well, I would put it, so this is part of stressing that morality is about self-interest. If this is really a friend and a value to you, and you think, and I was focusing on that they're causally responsible. So if you, you have a friend who's a billionaire and they're giving money left and right to universities, yeah, you for sure should talk to him about, like, what, why do you think this is something good to do? My view of the universities is they teach all kinds of corrupt things. They're passing along evil ideas, um, and this is what you're giving your money to. Like, why do you have such a... And it might be, like, he has a radically different view of what the universities did, do and what they teach. And that's some of what's going on. When I said they're taking deep dives, it's, like... How, they asked the question, like, how can so many students believe this? What's being taught? And 
it, like if they're really your friend, they don't, and you're friends with them, why would you want them to be supporting evil? Like you're doing something helpful for them, and they would experience it as, again, if you're not, particularly if you don't think there's moral culpability, they're doing it out of ignorance or mistake, you don't harangue them about it, but you say, like, this is a really consequential issue, and money is power, and you're giving your money, which means the power that you've created, your achievements, into the hands of evil. And it, it's, like, really destructive. It's destructive for them to be doing it. I mean, these schools, uh, the, the, I mean, how many anti-capitalists come out of universities uh, every year? I mean, it's destructive to what they're doing. So you're doing something good. And so it's not like you need to do it, oh, my God, morality's telling me i got to do this thing, too. You should want to do it if you're friends with the person. Thank you. Salutations. Thank you for the, com the talk and the answer so far. My question concerns redemption. In particular, what point is someone going too far? What, how do you define when the point they've crossed a particular line, especially such as Dr. Stadler? There's certain actions he does near the end of the book that appear to cross that line, but is there any point in which anybody can be redeemed? Or is there a no hold back? Anyone who interacts with them should probably push their relationship eject button and head off. There's two different things to think about in regard to that kind of redemption, which is, can the person change course? And I think the answer for some evil is no. Can a Jim Taggart change course? I think the answer in the end is no. His, uh, what he's made of his life, his whole motivational structure, it, it, there's nothing he can do to redeem himself. There's a separate question of whether you can make your change of course objective to another party, and particularly to the other party that you've wronged. And so, on. so there's a difference between saying the evil you've committed is so I can't deal with you anymore, I don't trust anything you say, and there's nothing the person can do to earn, that objectively, in action, to convince the other person that the person's changed course. That doesn't mean that they can't have changed course, but there's a separate issue of can you objectively convey that to the people you've wronged. And th this is, if you read the chapter on justice in OPAR, the issue of forgiveness comes up there, and this is the point that Dr. Peikoff makes in that, about forgiveness, that for when you've committed um, a, like a serious evil, I mean, take a Madoff, he didn't kill somebody, um, but like widespread fraud, bankrupted people and so on, can you earn their forgiveness? And I think the answer is no to that. <clears throat> Even if you could think of Madoff, and like he's like a borderline case and he probably can't redeem himself, um, but if he changed courses morally, there's a separate issue of can you convince other people, should other people be persuaded um, and think you've earned forgiveness? And the, the context is often um, the no, and the, one of the ways Dr. Peikoff puts it is, this is one of the many, many problems of someone who's evil, of what it would mean to earn forgiveness objectively, it's in many cases, uh, hard or impossible to specify. Thank you. Yeah, I think Jonathan, you're our last. Dionka. What would a proper approach to moral sanction look like in foreign policy? Well, that's a whole that's a whole <laughs> talk. But it would be it would be um, taking the side of the good seriously and taking evil seriously. So the um, so something like the United Nations is a complete abomination pr precisely because what it does is give sanction cover to Soviet Russia, now Vladimir Putin's Russia, to China, communist China, and now she's China. It gives sanction, approval, moral recognition and legitimacy to every dictatorship uh, and theocracy on the globe. A proper foreign policy would regard that kind of thing as an abomination and would figure out 
how to be fully on the side of the good, on the side of Hong Kong, of Taiwan, instead of letting what happened to Hong Kong, of what China did. It would, it would be through and through infused with morality, which it has basically none of today. If you, uh, another kind of example about the issue of sanction. Um, Biden dealing with the Chinese at one, and, and, and I think the State Department views it as a, as a kind of slip, he called Xi a dictator. And that was a big scandal, like as though the head of China is not a dictator and a mass murderer. It, uh, oh, we're, but we're going to say that? We're trying to negotiate with them and have better relationships with them. That's such a craven attitude towards morality and moral issues, and a proper foreign policy would be diametrically opposite of that.